We're delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India. It's a pleasure to present today, Never Can Fall It, in conversation with Zach Oya. Master storyteller Ken Pollock's latest novel, Never, an action-packed thriller with heroines, villains, false prophets, jaded politicians, and opportunistic revolutionaries, is steeped in cautionary wisdom for our times. In conversation with author Zach Oya, Pollock explores the world of his group-spanning drama and gives us a glimpse into his inspirations and writing process. Ken Follett was 27 when he wrote Eye of the Needle, an award-winning thriller that became an international bestseller. He then surprised everyone with the Pillars of the Earth, a captivating novel about the building of a cathedral in the Middle Ages, and its long-awaited sequel, World Without End, which was the number one bestseller in the USA, UK, and Europe. For his third novel in the Kingsbridge series is A Column of Fire, and he has also recently published a prequel to this series, The Evening and the Morning. After Kingsbridge, Pollitt wrote the best-selling Century Trilogy and never his first contemporary novel in 17 years. Zach Weyer has written the Majestic Trilogy of thrillers consisting of Mr. Majestic, Hurry, a hero of hire and tropical detective, set in Bangalore where he lives. He also published several non-fiction bestsellers and has contributed many quirky stories to nearly 100 newspapers and magazines. His writings have been translated into more than 20 languages and included numerous anthologies like the Best Asian Travel Writing 2020. He's currently working as lead vocalist for the Swedish cyberpunk disco orchestra, the ANDA. His travel memoir, Digesting India, will be out this year. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them into the comment section on your screen. Ladies and gentlemen, never can follow it in conversation with Zach Weyer. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome to India and the world famous Jaipur Literature Festival, Ken. Um, but you are, of course, not in India right now because of Corona, COVID, Delta, Omicron, and so on and so on. But you are actually, where are you? Uh, is this place that we see behind you? Is this where you write your books? Could you yes. just describe the room for us? Yes, uh, this is my library. I'm at my country house, which is in a town called Stevenage, about 30 miles north of London. And uh, this is the library where I work, and this is the chair where I sit. And you're on the screen that I normally write on. Oh. Uh, and I like to be That's uh, surrounded by books when I'm writing. Um, and uh, so as you can see, I am surrounded by books. A lot of reference books, a lot of history books here. And a, a fire to keep me warm in the English winter. Okay. And do you have like a coffee maker or a tea maker or do you have like a bottle of... Uh, whiskey or something to keep you uh, inspired? Uh, you know, in, uh, in England, we have a custom called dry January, which means that we don't drink alcohol in January. And uh, so I haven't had uh, any whiskey for, uh, for uh, 21 days. Um, and I would really like some now, but um, I have to wait until the 1st of February. Uh, but in any event, um, I, I never drink while I'm writing, uh, simply, be simply because as soon as I have a, as soon as I have a glass of wine or, or a whiskey, uh, I lose all motivation to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I do sometimes drink coffee. I've got a coffee right. maker, actually not in this room, but in the next room, okay. and uh, that um, that keeps me going sometimes. Mm. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, I feel now that we're sort of uh, getting into your um, writing space. So uh, I think yes. even for the viewers that uh, will be uh, to know. And have you, actually I wanted to ask you, have you ever traveled to India uh, or thought of traveling to India or maybe thought of setting a novel in India or in some Indian context? Yes, I've traveled to India. Um, uh, I, tra I visited India um, as a tourist uh, uh, for uh, three weeks. And I've also visited India to do book, book publicity because I have a lot of uh, Indian readers, uh, which makes me very happy. And I've, I've traveled twice, I think, to India to talk to them and to publicize my books. So, um, but as you know, um, uh, for for the for the British India is also very present to us. There are lots of 
in in this country there are many many people of indian origin and uh so we feel even when we're not in india we feel close to india mm -hmm. but um, just a hypothetical question then um, supposing you were to write a thriller set in india what do you think would be the most thrilling aspect of india as such like i'm not trying to steal any ideas from you but i would be curious to know how a master right thriller writer like you would think of india as a topic for example agatha christie i don't know if you know but she often used poisoned curries as murder weapons in her detective <laughs> novels because the curry flavor was good to hide um, you know poison <laughs> uh, flavors very <laughs> i didn't realize that i've read a lot of agatha christie and i love her books uh, but i hadn't noticed curries, i think i hadn't noticed the mm. poison curry <laughs> but uh yes it's good because the 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 uh the spices would cover up the bad taste of the right. poison i suppose yes, yes. that would have been her thinking um what would i do with a thriller in india well some of my memories of india uh first of all uh um if it was a crime uh the getaway would be crucial wouldn't it because transport in india is not always 100% reliable Right. Am I right, right in saying that? That's yes, I, th I think that's right. Mm. So uh, the getaway would be important. You could commit the perfect crime, but then um, when you tried to get away, the train would be late, or the bus would be late, mm. or the road would be that there would be a traffic jam on the road. So uh, that would be a, an aspect. But of course, I mean, but the I mean, the main aspect would be the landscape. You would uh because it's so it's so beautiful and mm. uh you would want to use that you would mm. want to have maybe maybe scenes of um pursuit mm. maybe a chase of some kind across mm -hmm. the landscape uh, right. that would be yeah. quite a good thing to do yeah yeah okay. it's uh it's um it would be it would be a very rich background wouldn't it for a novel definitely and i think that idea of uh, the the traffic slowing it all down into slow motion is probably what would make it very unique because we deal with it daily here when we try to get to events and get back from events that we end up spending more time on travel than actually doing the events but um since you were talking about the landscape there so in your new book uh never for which i must congratulate you and uh, hats off um thank you it so, starts in africa uh which is basically just across the ocean from where i am right now and it opens in up in the sub saharan desert yeah so uh when i was reading that opening part uh, how they travel through the desert while they're tracking those drug smugglers and it made me wonder did you actually go there uh for your research or maybe you were even riding on a camel to sahara like this um, <laughs> or did you send one of your 25 assistants or did you just watch african tv or read up in lonely planet or wikipedia how to survive in the desert like how much hands on was your research to create that um, african landscape and that you know that vivid feeling of actually being there in that dangerous place i um uh, of course i couldn't travel while i was writing never because it was locked down and the planes oh. weren't even flying mm -hmm. so i do normally pre very much prefer to visit any place that i'm writing about mm. um uh, but it wasn't possible however uh, i've been to china several times so i was able to write about china i've been to washington dc many mm. times and have been inside the white house mm. uh, several times so mm. i was familiar and i've and i have i've been in the north african desert i visited several north african countries however uh, yeah. uh, i have never visited chad which is the country where the early part of never right. is set uh, mm. i would very much have liked to visit chad mm. but it wasn't possible in the lockdown mm. so i relied on photographs films the several films have been shot in chad mm, mm, mm. uh and um 
I watched films. I interviewed people who'd lived there, and there are many good photographs on the internet. So I had to manage with that. Mm. Uh, the other um, tremendous resource mm. for an author, and you, you, I, I expect you have used this yourself, is Google Earth, mm. because with Google Earth you can see a satellite photograph of anywhere on the planet. Right, and it's right, quite right. wonderful if you have to write about a place that you've never visited mm. and you're not able to make a research trip, mm. uh, you can see uh, you mm. can see the place on the satellite. And you can often see in some detail, some satellite pictures are really quite marvelous. You can see some of those pictures, you can see the cars queuing up at the traffic lights, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was in for this book in particular, for Never in particular, mm -hmm. Google Earth was very useful to me because I couldn't do my normal traveling. Mm -hmm. But generally, you've been traveling to the places you write about, and you would recommend that to other authors. I imagine lots of uh, people who want to write thrillers will be uh, listening to this conversation and want to know your secret tricks. So, you would say that. Uh, Hands-on experience is always yes, I would. Um, but of course, if they if they're not if they're not established writers, then it may be that they can't afford to mm. travel. And mm. certainly, when I wrote my first successful book, Eye of the Needle, uh, I did I um, it, it, that was my first success. So before that book mm. was published, I could not afford to travel for research. Um, fortunately, a, a, much of Eye of the Needle is set in Scotland. Mm. Uh, and I had never been to Scotland at that time. Mm. Uh, so um, I went to my local library, and this was um, 1977. Mm. Uh, and they had, a, they had a touring guide to Scotland that had been published in 1947. <laughs> <laughs> so for anybody wanting to visit Scotland at that time, mm. it was, of course, completely useless. But for me, it was perfect because right. it described Scotland as it was just after mm. the war. Mm. <coughs> just exactly what I needed for research. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, in this new book of yours, apart from all manner of Africans and so on, uh, it features an international cast of Islamist insurgents and Muslim madmen and as America's first women pres woman president and corrupt uh, Chinese nuclear and nuclear trigger happy North Koreans and also a uh, busload of uh, refugees traveling through the desert. And so it's a quite a vast cast. Um, would you like to reveal something about the plot of the novel? What are all these spies from CIA and elsewhere up to in Africa in your book? Um, the, the story of Never uh, is a story of an international crisis that threatens to lead to the outbreak of a third world war. And the idea came from my study of the outbreak of the first world mm. war. The striking thing about the outbreak of the First World War is that nobody wanted it. None of the European presidents and emperors actually wanted to have a war, but mm. they all made decisions, decisions which took us by small steps mm. closer and closer to a world war. And I asked myself, could that happen today? Could mm. there be another world war? Not because anybody wanted a war, not because there was a fascist country that needed to be defeated as, mm. as there was in 1939, um, uh, but just because people found themselves pushed into decisions which just took the world closer to that terrible situation. Mm. And of course, Although uh, terrible though the First World War was, the Third World War would be much worse. So that's um, the plot of Never. And the reason that the, the story takes place in Africa and in the United States and China and in other countries. And the reason for that is that, that the world is so closely linked 
And we are all linked so closely together now that um, uh, the, the, in, the initial incident in Never, mm -hmm. the, the, the modern parallel to the assassination in Sarajevo, which kicked off World War I, the mm -hmm. modern equivalent is the killing of an American soldier in Chad by a terrorist using a Chinese rifle. Mm. And that, uh, that incident, uh, although it's only one man, uh, and sad to say, terrorist killings are not that unusual mm. today. Nevertheless, although it's not a major incident, it's a trigger for other incidents. Uh, and the, the, the incidents appear, the repercussions happen like dominoes falling over, all in a line. Um, and uh, so, so what we see is a gradual escalation. Each event in the book, and, and by the way, the characters in the book are, are all trying to prevent this war. All the characters, they, there's, um, there's a kind of a lack of villains. My publisher said, uh, there, aren't any, there aren't enough horrible, horrible villains in this one, Ken. <laughs> and um, that's because each of the major characters is trying to prevent the war mm. and uh and that they are finding it they're struggling they're finding it very difficult because right. the es escalation continues mm. so um so the plot is really about people trying to prevent a war and step by step being forced closer and closer to it mm. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. And like uh, the Chinese part was quite fascinating how you sort of um, uh, nail the, the difficult thing of, of the China of now, which is like a superpower and uh, as compared to the China of uh, like Mao Zedong, which was like a country that nobody really cared about in that sort of a geopolitical sense. And, um, and the thing that, uh, that struck me also was that you're mostly known for your historical thrillers with all these uh, old uh, world wars and uh, spies of, of the, the early 20th century and whatnot. And like Eye of the Needle, which was your first super bestseller. But so this time you've written a slightly futuristic book about a potential World War, war III and how it, um, it, um, it's uh, sort of snowballing into into um, a dangerous thing so um, and and uh, it's a it's a it's a dangerous scenario with much more sophisticated weapons than uh, these kind of historical things <laughs> but also I was thinking of uh, uh, although you seem to find a lot of inspiration in wars and world wars, World War I, World War II, you've written about them all. Um, this struck me as a kind of like an anti-war book on some level. So, so, and I wanted to ask you, do you feel that it is important for us writers to like, um, how should I put it, take responsibility for our words and to show a sort of social responsibility in our work, like like here you're kind of trying to convince people that a third world war is a bit of an unnecessary thing. Um, for me, Zach, um, always the, the main responsibility of the author is to write a great story. Mm. Um, anything else comes second. But I do believe that, that book readers are are rather intelligent people and they like to learn. Mm. And so if one of my books is a great story and in addition, the reader learns something, mm. then um, that's a kind of a bonus. It's, a, it's an extra. Right. Uh, and uh, I think my writers enjoy that aspect of my mm. books, that they're, they're, I, I'm, I'm careful with the research so you know that the background to the story, the history of the period, for example, or in the case of Never, mm. the way the Chinese government works, they, mm. my readers know that these are accurate because they know that I, I do careful, careful research. Mm. So um, 
so it's a secondary thing. The main thing is always, must always be a great story. Nobody, so, yeah. see the other thing, Zach, is that I'm not cleverer than my readers. My readers are smart people mm -hmm. and they don't want me to tell them uh, how, what they should think. Mm -hmm. uh, and they certainly don't want me to tell them how they should vote, even though I might have my own strong opinions personally. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in that. Mm -hmm. So um, I would never... Uh, I would never write a book that had a message. Mm. I don't believe in messages in mm. literature, in art mm. generally, actually. Mm. Um, it tends to be heavy handed. It mm. tends to become preaching, doesn't it? I don't right. like, nobody likes books that preach at them. Mm. Which, so, so what do we do, authors? We say to our readers, come with me and I'll show you something. I will show you what it was like to build a cathedral in the Middle Ages. Mm. Or I will show you what it was like to live through the Second World War mm. and so on. So we don't, we don't um, in my opinion, we don't give them messages. We don't give them instruction, but we show them something. What we have, mm. all authors have a very vivid imagination. In that respect, we are different from everybody else. We have a, we have a very powerful imagination. We can imagine these stories. Mm. And so that's what we do. We say, look, I'll come with me and I'll show you what mm. I've imagined. I'll show you how it was mm. to be, to live through the great plague that's called the Black Death, for example. Or, or to live through a Viking attack on your village or town. That's the kind of thing. That, that's, I think, that's the important thing about what we do. Right. But I would like to point out at this point that you tend to, I mean, at least in the books I've read, there are strong female characters who are very different from the typical, stereotypical depictions of women, often mostly as victims in thrillers. But your women are often the more powerful characters in the book. Is that deliberate? I mean, that's like, sounds like slightly feminist uh, <clears throat> thinking on your part as an author. Well, it's, um, it's mainly, I do this mainly for literary reasons. Um, when I was thinking about Eye of the Needle all those years ago, um, I originally thought the climax of the book would be a battle between two men on a lonely island. Mm. Uh, and then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if the battle was between a man and a woman at the end of the story? Right. And that made the story so much more interesting. After all, we have all read uh, 50 thrillers which end with a battle between two men. Uh, but it was it it hadn't been done before. It wasn't just unusual. It was unknown mm. uh, for a woman to be the hero of that sort of book. It made the book very different and much more interesting. Not only was uh, the hero uh, a woman, but she had a child, a four-year-old child, who she had to worry about at the same time as she was worrying about this man that she had mm. to try and kill. And... Uh, that made it a completely different book. It made it a much more appealing story. Mm -hmm. um, and ever since then, I've always, there've always been all of my books. Women have had a, uh, a strong, a strong role. I agree with you completely when you say that the stereotypical woman in a thriller um, really was only there uh, to be rescued uh, mm -hmm. or to make extra trouble for the hero. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we've moved on since then. Um, uh, and I think, um, but you know, but the world has changed, hasn't it? I mean, it's not just, not just, you know, it's, it's not just about women appearing in thrillers. It's about right. women um, um, being uh, police officers and mm -hmm. judges and Prime Minister. running banks and big companies mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That, But that's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it would be, uh, nowadays it would be silly I, it's also about my generation mm. um, I was a, a student at university in London in the 60s and um, all the girls that we we young men liked 
mm. were all saying to us, the way women are treated in our society is unfair. Uh, we're treated differently from men. We're not offered the same amount of money. Uh, we have we work for lower pay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and when I was young, you know, a woman a woman couldn't get a loan from a bank without having either either the signature of her father or the signature of her husband. <laughs> when I tell when I tell my grandchildren that nowadays, they don't believe me. They say, "What? Really? A man had to sign." They can't believe that it was. And I say to them, yes, and your mothers and grandmothers really fought hard to change that right. situation. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it's it's so, Zach, it's mainly for literary reasons. The book is better if it has strong women, but it's also uh, a, a, it's also a feature of um, what's been happening in the world in my life. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> uh, that's very interesting. And uh, then another thing I wanted to ask you is that your books uh, tend to be like uh, some critic uh, recently pointed out that they're vast, thoroughly researched novels filled with huge casts of characters and multiple interconnected storylines. So uh, just out of professional uh, curiosity, how many months or years do you spend on weaving together a novel like Never? Well, Never was unusual. Um, I wrote it very quickly, quickly for me anyway. That's partly because of lockdown, because mm. there was nothing else to do. Right. Uh, I didn't travel. I didn't mm. uh, go to restaurants with my friends. I didn't go to the theatre. Um, so Never was exceptional. But normally a book mm. like that would take me three years. And the three years is divided up quite neatly. The first year would be research and planning. And during that time, I write an outline of the story, which by the time, by the, by the end of that year, it's 50 or 60 pages, and it tells what happens in every chapter of the book. And then the second year, I write the first draft. Uh, then the third year, I rewrite it. That's my, uh, that's my normal timetable um, for a long historical novel, three years. That uh, sounds reasonable. I think I take that long time myself. Uh, does it help that uh, uh, in your writing that you spent some time in your youth working as a newspaper reporter? Was it, I mean, is that a good experience for an aspiring writer to uh, have? Yes, it, for the best thing about it was that um, for five years I was writing every day. And um, even if even if you even if you are quite, even if your writing is quite fluent, the experience of just doing it so much, um, uh, it becomes second nature to write, to think about writing clearly. Mm. Uh, uh, people read newspapers very quickly, mm. um, and they don't want, they don't want atmosphere, uh, and they don't want. Um, uh, you know, spirituality, mm -hmm. they want the facts, uh, and they also want the sentences to be very clear. They don't want mm -hmm. Marcel Proust's long sentences. They want something quite brisk. And so for, for, all, for those years, every day, I was trying to write like that, trying to write clearly so that the meaning of the sentence would be instantly understandable. Uh, and I think that was helpful to me uh, when I started to write novels, of course, I had to change my style. I had to slow it down because the reader of a novel doesn't want just the facts. The reader of the novel wants to be drawn into mm. the imaginary world that the author has created right, right, right. Uh, and to begin to care about the people in that imaginary world as if they were real. Mm. So that's a, that, is a, that is a different style of writing. But clarity, for me, Clarity is important in all, every kind of writing. Mm. Newspapers and novels and TV scripts, always clarity. That's our first duty. If, we, if we're not good at that, we're, we're not good at anything. You know, we, our, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to put ideas into the minds of our readers. We're trying to share our ideas. And if you don't do that well, then in my opinion, you're not writing well. Um, so the... So 
I the and I think the other thing was um, learning that you can you generally speaking everything uh, all information is available you know on a newspaper you don't say if your if your editor says to you go and find out this uh, you don't say oh I don't think we can find that out mm. you say I'll I'll try I'll do my best right and uh, most of the time if you're determined most of the time you can find out what the editor wants you to find out so that sort of um uh, uh the value of persistence mm -hmm. and determination in research that's something else i learned from newspapers so yeah. i think overall it was a good experience for me okay and and how does the music fit in uh, because uh, i'm a bit curious about that also because i work part-time in a synth pop group as well uh, and I understand you fiddle with the balalaika and you play uh, blues, uh, bass in, in some band. Uh, does that uh, help you in some way to maybe uh, avoid writer's block or something like that? Or uh, is that part of your, I mean, how does that sort of work together with your writing, basically, is what I'm asking. What I like about playing in the band is that it is completely different from what I do all day. Uh, writing is cerebral and my books are plotted so that um, uh, there, are, there are always complications of the kind, somebody tells a lie, some people know that it's a lie, some people don't know, so they, they find out. These complications, it's cerebral. You have to think all the time. And when you play in the band, it's not about thinking. In fact, if you start to think about what you're playing, you, f you make mistakes. <laughs> mm. um, okay. And of course, the, the, um, the, if it's, it's rock and roll or the blues, the music is so loud, you can hardly mm. think anyway. I sometimes, I sometimes feel that there's a connection between the fingertips and the ears that doesn't pass through the brain. And so if you, if once you get in the zone and you'll know this as a musician, if you get in the zone, it's not, it's not automatic, but it's also not, in some ways it's not conscious. You're just, you're doing the right thing. Mm. Uh, and it's sounding quite good, but you're not thinking to yourself, oh, oh, if I play an A flat here, that'll sound quite good. By the time you've had that thought, it's too late to play the A flat. Mm. <laughs> so, um, uh, I like the fact that it's it's so um, it's so um, tactile, right, 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 right? It's it's sensory. It's mm. not intellectual playing music in a band, mm. Mm. and uh, uh, and that's why I find it so incredibly relaxing. Right. I uh, I've actually also before this talk I. I connect, contacted many of your fans in India to get some, you know, because we are not doing a live program, but I, then I thought it would be nice if they can get their questions answered. So I have one last question for myself and then I'll ask, uh, forward their questions to you. Good. And uh, so what I was really wanted to ask you is that when I, uh, first I was thinking, oh, maybe your next novel will be about this pandemic. But then I, of course, remembered that in 2004, you released a novel called Whiteout, which is about a lethal virus that escapes from a lab in Scotland. And, and uh, you know, um, makes us all mask up like this. Uh, it's an Ebola type of virus. And, um, and that was... Uh, 15 years ago, and today we are suffering from, and then uh, in 2019, 15 years after the novel, of course, there was the pandemic. And uh, so having said that, do you think that never also might be similarly prophetic so that 15 years from now, that is in 2036, we will be on the brink of World War Three? I think it's perfectly possible. Uh, what, that's um uh what makes the novel plausible is that it really could happen and the uh, the novel shows one way in which the third world war could break out but of course we know that there are many others mm. uh in never 
the threat of World War III comes from uh, decisions that people make, but it could just as easily come from a mistake. And we know, mm -hmm. don't we, that more than once um, uh, the alarm has been given that mm. Soviet missiles have been launched and it turns out to be a flock of geese. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, Or, of course, the other way in which a Third World War could start would be because the President of the United States is mad. And, mm. and, and we do know now that that's not impossible either. Right, um, yes. So I think I, I think um, it's 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 horribly possible. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's the uh, that would be a sad note to end this on. But instead, uh, we have some of your fans here in India emailed me their uh, questions, and I'll go through them quickly. So Good. yes, uh, Ankush Saikia, who is a young thriller writer in Assam. He writes that I doubt Ken Follett would have heard of me, but you could ask him how he would see his career shaping up, up if he were me and started today. Um, do you know, I don't think it's very different. We notice the differences, of course, but um, uh, the main thing is uh, that you have to write something that makes an editor say, to himself, I must publish this book. This book is, is great. It's going to be a huge success. It's going to shake the world. And I want it to be published by me and my company. Mm. Um, and I don't want this book to be published by a rival company to me. Mm. So, so you, I think it's very important to always try and write something exceptional. Um, it, the temptation, of course, is to look on what's look at what's on the bestseller list mm. and think I'll write something like that. Um, but that isn't going to make you exceptional. That 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 will make the editor say, "Well, I've already got a writer like that, and I don't need two. Um, so what you have to do is you have to write something that really uh, makes the editor say, "Wow, right? I haven't seen anything quite like this mm. before, mm. Uh, and I must have it." Um, so, um, as, of course, you have to have, uh, and our questioner um, will have, if he's already writing thrillers, he will have some of the necessary skills. Mm -hmm. He will be able to set a scene, create a character, write dialogue, create a cliffhanger, create suspense. He's, he's probably doing all of those things. Mm -hmm. And what he needs is, what he now needs is for everybody who likes uh, novels or everybody who likes that type of novel to say, there's a great new guy mm. or woman. Uh, and uh, we must, we must read, we must read this because it's new and interesting and different. Right. That's, that's the kind of thing that you need to think about if you want to break through into the bestseller lists. Right. And to have as many global international super bestsellers as you have. Uh, then uh, Mrs. Bidisha from uh, Delhi would like to know when your novels are adapted for the screen, how closely involved are you in the, with the screenwriting and filming process? Like, do you vet the screenplay and involve yourself in casting or are you out of the picture once the rights are sold? I'm almost out of the picture. Um, the, uh, I, I don't write the screenplays. I'm not involved in the casting. Um, uh, I generally speaking, the producers invite me to the set to meet the actors and to look at what they're doing, but they don't want me to tell them what to do. And I don't want to tell them what to do because here's the difference between what I do and what they do. I tell a story in words and they tell a story in pictures, mm. and it's a different skill. And so I don't feel that I can tell them how to do their job. Um, so I don't, I don't get involved. I don't have those skills. Mm. Um, uh, and I enjoy, I always enjoy meeting the actors and I've got friends who are actors. I mean, I like, I love the theater. That kind of thing is, is very dear to me. Um, but, um, 
but I wouldn't tell an actor what to do and I wouldn't tell a film director or a screenwriter what to do. Um, uh, I've, um, uh, I watch from afar and I cross my fingers. And generally speaking, I've been lucky. There have been some pretty good television series made of my stories and one good movie. Um, there have been some bad ones as well, but, um, uh, you know, you basically, um, uh, and uh, here's the thing, the writers never say no to the money. <laughs> We're nervous about it. We hope, we hope that, uh, that, that, that it'll be a good television show. Mm. Um, and we, but we take the risk and um, we put the money in the bank. Great. Uh, then another question it's, uh, from Mr. Sampart, who is also in Delhi and who finds your books very, very unputdownable. So he asks, uh, so you have been a popular fiction writer for nearly half a century and insanely successful. And, but clearly audiences have changed from uh, 1970s to 2021. Did you ever have to make adjustments in your approach to writing because you felt audiences have changed or did the publishers suggest that you should change your writing to, to go with the times? Um, well, we, um, uh, one difference, it doesn't affect me very much, but it affects my books. We have, um, sometimes nowadays we, before the book is published, we have a sensitivity audit. That's to say somebody reads the book to see whether there is anything in the book that might be might be offensive to uh for example disabled people uh gay people uh, mm. uh people of color um and um uh and of course um i would never consciously write anything that offended uh, people in that way i hate i hate that kind of prejudice right. but it's interesting how um, sometimes you can write something that you don't know. Mm. It doesn't you don't think it's offensive, mm. um, uh, but but as um, you know, you, you you might not be able to fully grasp the sensitivities of some groups of people. So mm. um, we have a we have a sensitivity uh, audit and. And I always accept all the recommendations because, you know, mm. my, my books are not about offending people. My books uh, are for people to enjoy. They're for pleasure. Right, right, right. And um, so I don't mind that at all. But that is a new thing. Um, by and large, I don't think readers change much. The technology has changed. Mm. Some Many people now read my books on a screen. Mm. Uh, and many people read them. Um, many people listen to my books being read by an mm. actor. Uh, that Neither of those things used to happen, but it doesn't make much difference to me. I still write mm. the same kind of stories. Uh, I'm very happy, mm. you know, that, that actors, wonderful actors read my stories aloud. Mm. Uh, and of course, I'm, as I'm sure you know, they, they use different accents for mm. the different characters' speech and... Um, different intonations they uh, uh you know a, a, mm. a, a female actor for example will change her voice so that you know that, she, that a man is speaking mm. and vice versa a male actor will change mm. his voice so that you know that the words are being spoken by a woman in the story all that kind of thing is magical and i'm very mm. grateful to actors who do that for me right. um but the basic nature of the story i don't think has changed mm. Okay, I think uh, there's only time for one last question from your fans, but this is from your probably biggest fan in all of Asia, Mr. Vikar Ahmed Said, And he has a quite interesting question. I'm a huge fan, he writes, and thoroughly enjoyed reading your Century Trilogy and the Kingsbridge series of novels. Your books display a staggering amount of historical research, but have you ever been tempted to write non-fiction books because you read as much or sometimes even more than what an academic historian would read on a specific team? 
What's, what would you say um, to that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, certainly not tempted to write history books. Uh, I wrote a non-fiction story called On Wings of Eagles, but it's a, it's a true story, but it, it, the events in the story were very like a thriller. Mm. And um, recently I wrote a very short book about the Cathedral of Notre Dame in mm. Paris uh, after it burned down. Um, and uh, okay. I, I, wrote, I wrote the book to explain why that event was so moving for so many people all over the world. Uh, and and uh, I gave my um, I gave gave my royalties, and the publisher gave the profits to uh, to um, the to ancient buildings in France to preserve ancient buildings in France. Um, uh, but that but this is obviously um, a, a a sideline in my career because mm. what I'm good at is fiction, is stories. Um, perhaps I might be able to write a history book. I might even be able to write a good history book, but it's not my talent. You know, um, I might, <laughs> I might be able to play in a in a in a you know in a rock band and make records, but it's not my talent. Um, right. It's not what I'm really good at. I might be okay. I'm you know I'm not a bad bass guitarist, mm. um, but I'm not brilliant, uh, and I would be a not bad history writer, but I wouldn't be brilliant. It's best to, you know, if if you discover something that you can do really well, mm. um, the the smart thing to do and the enjoyable thing to do is is to do that one thing, mm. do something really well and in, and enjoy it. I really enjoy my work, uh, and um, you know, people people who are lucky enough to have a job they enjoy um, uh, have a happy life. Thank you. I, I think uh, our time has run out, but that's a very beautiful way to end this conversation. I know I've been challenging you on a few points, but uh, on the whole, I think uh, your fans here in India will really love to hear your advice uh, on all these things. So thank Good. you so well, much it's, for being part of this show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken College and Zach Weir for that fascinating conversation. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay locked on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Front Lawn, Mughal Tent and Darbar Hall. If you miss any particular session, please note that they will be uploaded in our archives on Facebook and YouTube post the festival. Hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.